Next up, we have Joshua Ernie, Microsoft Ambassador and Senior Software Engineer at MS3. I'm sure you've heard of Joshua's name before. He's a globally recognized data weave expert and regularly publishes articles on his blog and speaks at meetups and other events. Today he's going to share with you what he thinks is the best thing that has happened to data weave since sliced bread, the update function. Joshua, take it away. Hi, my name is Joshua Ernie and welcome to my Connect 2020 virtual presentation. The update function, the best thing to happen to data weave since sliced bread. Let's get started. So let's quickly go over the agenda for the presentation. Overall, I'm going to try to keep things short and simple, just giving you the context that you need to understand what the update function is, why the language needed it, and how you can effectively use it. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about me and my background. Then we'll dive into why it's been so difficult to modify single values in nested data structures in DataWeave. And I'll briefly discuss some of my attempts at fixing this problem why they didn't work, and then we'll follow up with the solution that the data weave team came up with, which is the update function. I'll cover how you can use this function to elegantly solve the stated problem, as well as covers an issue that you might encounter while working with this function with XML. And then we'll wrap things up with a conclusion. So who am I? I've been a MuleSoft ambassador for about two years now. I'm also a developer and architect focusing in the application integration space. I've been working with MuleSoft products for about four years, and I'm the author at Journey.io, which is a DataWeave-centric blog that I write and talk about a lot of things related to DataWeave transformations. Let's talk about the problem real quick. For example, if you've ever tried to mask data in a payload like personal information, emails, et cetera, you've probably run into this problem before. And if you haven't, you're in luck because it's already been solved. So an example of this problem that we're going to use throughout the presentation is on the slide here. How do you transform this where we have a payload that contains multiple levels of data and transform just a single element in it? So how do I change Hello Muleys into Hello World? Let's look at some of my attempted solutions. So my first attempt stemmed at what I already knew about Python. In Python, you can use selectors on the left-hand side of an equal sign to define where you want the value on the right-hand side of the equal sign to be placed. And maybe you've tried something else like this before. Guess how it went. Unfortunately, it didn't work out too well. The syntax is completely invalid. DataWeave won't even run this particular code because selectors like payload.root return the value that they select. So if you were to go and evaluate the code that I was trying to use, it would be like trying to set a string equal to a string. And that doesn't really work. So I took some time and I reflected a bit on what the actual problem was. So in DataWeave, all of our values are immutable. We can't change data in place. That was my main problem. So because of that, what I needed to do was not only update the value that I was interested in updating, but also rebuild the entire data structure from the input structure so that it all made it into the output. And finally, I realized that the data that I'm working with could probably be represented easily as a tree so that my best strategy moving forward was likely going to be recursion. And if you look at the image on the bottom of the slide, you'll see how the data structure that I provided earlier can be represented as a tree. We have different nodes like root, level one, data, and then we have the values as leaves on the end of this tree. So the big problem when trying to use data weave to update values in a nested data structure is that it's a simple use case that requires the user to implement an error prone and rarely needed technique in data transformation, which is recursion. Now, when I say it's rarely needed, I just mean that there's many situations where recursion can be concealed by a good implementation in a nice API. And as we'll see, this is certainly one of those situations. So as a second attempt, I wrote a couple of utility functions to hide the recursion and provide a better API for dealing with these kinds of situations. The function apply to values takes in a collection and a function that describes how to modify all the values in the collection that was provided. This is later superseded by the map leaves function. The second function I tried to create, apply when key, is the same as apply to value, but there's an additional conditional logic step applied where you can supply the value of the key that can also be used to determine if the value should be modified. Unfortunately, 
this was a failure as well. Apply to values indiscriminately applies the function to every value, regardless of where it exists on the data structure. And apply when key has no knowledge of the path that it took to get to the value. So it will update both instances of data. If you look at the pane on the left-hand side, on lines four and line six, you'll see we have hello muleys and hello connect. And when I use the apply when key function to just select data to do the update on, which you can see on line 18 in the center pane, it just indiscriminately, anytime you see the key data, it applies hello world to it. And we only want the output on line four to say hello world. But the biggest problem with the, both of these solutions is that neither solution can update attributes, which means they're incompatible with XML. So data weaves update function comes to the rescue here. In Mule's 4.2.2 release, it introduced the values module, which includes the update function. The update function increases the ergonomics of updating nested data in place. And I say in place in quotes because data weave isn't actually modifying the values in place. As you know, all of the values in data weave are immutable. What it's doing instead is rebuilding all the data around that new value, but insulating the user from all of that complexity. And what's also nice about the update function is that it can update XML attributes, and it keeps track of the path as it crawls through the data structure. So root.level.data and root.level.level2.data are recognized as different keys. Here's an example of the update function in action. On the left pane, you can see the input that we've been using. And in the center pane on line four, you can see that we need to import this function from the values module. And on line six, you can see it in use. If you look at the output pane on the right-hand side, you can see that the update function successfully updated root.level1.data and left root.level1.level2.data alone. So let's review how you can use this function. It's really easy. You describe the data that you want to update first, you name the update function, and then you provide an array that describes the path to the element that you'd like to update. Finally, you, use, you follow this array with the with function followed by the value that you want to provide for the update. So does it work with XML? Of course. If you look at the left-hand side, that's just an XML representation of the JSON data that we were dealing with earlier. In the center, the code is completely the same. And on the right-hand side, we can see an XML representation of the output. We're on line four. We've updated that value to hello world. And if you're wondering about XML attributes like I was referring to earlier as a key problem in some of my solution attempts, we'll cover that in a couple slides. There are three different ways you can target data using the update function. One is fields, which are object keys. To do that, you use a string in the path. You can also do indexes. And for that, you use a number, specifically an integer, in the path. And you can use that to update arrays. And finally, you can use attributes which you'll use the adder function included in the values module. And let's see an example of that in the next slide. So on the left, you can see we've defined an attribute context on the root element and set it to MuleSoft. In the center pane where the data weave script is, we first import the update and adder functions. And when defining the path to an attribute, what we want to do is first define the element that the attribute is placed on, in this case is root, and then we want to wrap the attribute's name in the adder function. And then as you can see, we replace this with Salesforce. And on the output on line two, you can see the context was modified from MuleSoft to Salesforce. Let's go over a common gotcha when dealing with the update function. Objects in data weave support duplicate keys. And when we look at XML, it's clear why. If you look at the right hand pane here, this is a very common XML pattern where we have an encompassing element followed by a repeated number of child elements. Now, this isn't only supported in XML, it's supported in JSON as well. The JSON spec doesn't explicitly state that duplicate keys in an object are invalid. It says that they shouldn't be used, but in the definition of should in that particular context, it means they're technically allowed but should probably be avoided. DataWeave still supports duplicate keys in this case because it needs to support them for XML. 
So just note here that even though this might look odd in many programming languages, having repeated keys is not okay. In Dataweave, it's allowed. So the question becomes, how do we update objects with duplicate keys using the update function? If we try updating these duplicate keys by selecting the key name, Dataweave overwrites all of the instances of that particular key. So here on the left side, we have data set to hello, space, goodbye, world, in an array that contains the string hi. And when we try to update the data attribute, as you can see on line six in the center page, in the center pane, we get an output that is MuleSoft for all of them. Whereas maybe we only wanted to set the first piece of data to be hello. If we try selecting a particular key by index, kind of treating objects as arrays or maybe an ordered object, Dataweave will only match if one of the values is an array. So in this case on line seven, where we have that data set to that array with a string that, can, that says hi, that's the one that matches. If you look at line six here in the center pane, we have payload update and then the path to the object, which is root data zero, the data we've update function interprets that zero as being an index of an array and not the index of the key of the particular object that you might want to update. So an important thing to keep in mind is whenever you're supplying numbers in the array path, they are always interpreted as array indexes and never object indexes. So getting around this issue is fairly simple and it still avoids recursion and we get to use all of the tools that we're already familiar with in Dataweave. I'll walk you through the simple three-step process. First, you wanna select the object that you wanna update and set it to a variable. This is what I'm doing in line six on the center pane. Next, you wanna transfer form the variable as needed. And I'm doing this on line eight through line 11. And then finally, you take that variable and you use it at the end of the update function to say, this is what I wanna update this existing value with. And as you can see here, we're trying to set the first instance of the key data where it says hello on line three on the input to say howdy. And you can see on line three of the output that we've successfully done that. So in conclusion, when your language only supports immutable data, updating single fields and nested data structures can be difficult, error prone, and unnecessarily expose recursion. The solution to this problem can be wrapped in an easy to use interface, and the update function solves many of these problems in a way that's easy to use and easy to learn. If you'd like to learn more about Dataweave, you can check out these couple of tutorials that I've developed with the Dataweave team. And after that, if you're ready to practice your skills, you can try your hand at my practice exercises. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. If you have any questions for Joshua, Vera, or myself, please remember to ask in the live chat. We'll stay online until 2.30 p.m. to answer your questions. Thanks again for attending and see you next time.